My name is Bill Swantner. I'm a certified Master Gardener in the state of Texas. My membership is with the Bear County Master Gardeners Association, and we'd like to welcome you to our YouTube series, All Things Gardening. It's 74 degrees and it's the middle of January. While it feels like spring, it's too early to start our spring gardens. But you can get a jump on things if you start your seeds indoors. In this presentation, Master Gardener Karen Gardner, who has received advanced training vegetables, will give us a step-by-step -step way on how to start our vegetables and our ornamentals by seeds indoors. I am a Bear County Master Gardener. I've done the Vegetable Specialist Training, um, and I love talking about growing vegetables. Today we're going to concentrate on seed starting as that process of growing our vegetables. Um, we, we do try to present information that's verified, been researched. Um, we we're, we're generally don't go, oh yeah, my great aunt, you know, Mildred said something, and you know, we try to get it research-based um, and relevant to San Antonio area. If I say something that I've tried, as I've gone through and done this presentation, I've actually done some research and tried to find sources that verified what I was saying and what I was doing. <laughs> if I do something that I haven't found a research-based thing for, I usually will tell you that. Okay. This is just me. But the rest of it is, is stuff that I've actually looked up, and I generally tend to look for university sources, especially Texas a of course. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about seed starting today. I will have to tell you, I have killed hundreds of little seedlings. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I tried for years, and I just was failing, and failing, and failing. And, um, well, a few years ago, I went to a presentation that somebody else gave, and I got a lot of pointers and a lot of things that helped me. And so I've kind of compiled, compiled what I learned from them, and then, of course, um, doing bear counter master gardening things. I've, I've learned a lot of other things. And this, this is kind of my process for starting seeds. Um, if you're here today to learn more about what to plant in the spring and when to plant it, at the end, I'll give you some, I'll tell you where you can find some links for that. So, but we're going to talk mainly about starting seeds today because it's really fun. <laughs> um, so why would I want to start seeds when I can just go to the nursery and buy nice little plants already? And part of the reason is it can be cheaper. Now I, I qualified that with it can be cheaper because <laughs> you can get kind of addicted to this and it's like, Oh, I want that seeds and those seeds and those seeds. Um, so you you can you can get into spending more money, but I, I look at it and say, this is my hobby. This is what I do for fun, and I do get food from it and everything. But there are a lot of other things I don't spend money on. So this is my uh -huh. my my indulgence. Um, you can start healthy plants, and we'll go through on how to do that. Um, the main reason I start seeds is because you get greater variety. When you go to the nurseries, they can't grow 50 different kinds of tomatoes and have them available. That's just not profitable for them. But there are over, what, 500 different varieties of tomatoes, and I want to grow every one. <laughs> you know? I'd be happy to grow just one. <laughs> well, I like to grow all, and there's a picture. I, I went out and picked some tomatoes one day, and I thought, oh, that looks great with all the different colors. So I took a picture. And, um, that was that was the spring grown tomatoes um, there but i like the variety another big reason for growing your own seeds is to extend the season if you went and started a tomato plant from a seed in the ground here in the spring you'd have to wait till the frosts were done you put it in the ground in march and it's going to grow into a plant, and then in June it's going to get fried, and you're not going to get any tomatoes from it. Right. So you have, there are certain plants that you have to start from transplants, or you're just not going to get any harvest. So extending the growing season, and also you can control the chemicals. Um, when you buy a transplant, you don't really know what they've done to that transplant before you bought it. So if you're wanting to watch the chemicals and, and cut back on those, you can control what you're doing to that plant. 
So let's get started. This is the biggest problem I've had with starting seeds. And I started with this slide of those ugly sad plants because <laughs> I have grown many of those ugly sad plants. Um, I'm going to leave this up for a second. You might want to write that down. I'm sorry I don't have an outline for you with all this information today, but um, that that's a really good article. Damping off is it's not one single disease. It's, it's more of what I would call a condition. And it's caused by a variety of different pathogens. So bacteria, viruses, just the climactic conditions that your seedlings are exposed to. What often happens in, in this example, oh, I need to learn how to use the pointer. In that example, see the seeds are coming up with the little plants that got these little patches of brown, and they're looking just kind of sad. Um, they're diseased. This is what's happened to me more often. My seed will come up, it's looking <coughs> healthy, it's looking great, the top part of the plant looks wonderful, and then I go out there the next day and it's just toppled over. And at first, when I, when I first experienced this years ago, I thought it was little bugs that were eating the stem or something. And it's not. It's, it's just pathos, pathogens. They've weakened the stem right there, and the bugs <coughs> just peel over and die. And the top still looks great. That's the sad part. But um, we're going to talk about how to prevent this. This is the main problem with growing things from seeds. Yeah, she said, she said, I thought it was slugs. And, and if it's in the garden, maybe it is slugs. But, you know, I was, these would be in flats. They're in my house. And I'm like, how are the bugs eating these and, and killing them? Well, it's the eaty beady bugs. It's the bacteria and the viruses and fungi. Okay, so to start off, um, the soil, the planting medium. And I, I actually put planting medium rather than soil. Because I, I want it to get in our heads that we're not going to go out in our yard and dig up soil and put it in, in our trays, okay? We, we use something <clears throat> sterile. We want to use something clean. I start with a mix. It's just a 50-50 mix of peat moss and vermiculite. Vermiculite, um, you can buy it at garden centers. Peat moss, you can buy it. Lowe's, um, garden centers, various places. I put in there fine peat moss. When you get that big cube of peat moss at the store, there are often twigs and little bits in there. I actually strain it. I got some hardware cloth, some quarter inch hardware cloth, and I made a frame, and I, and I strain the peat moss so that it's finer. I get the twigs and all that other thick stuff out. If you have a little teeny tiny tomato seed and it's struggling to come up, if you have a twig sitting on it, it's going to use all of its energy trying to push that twig away. So you want something fine and light, and the vermiculite is very light. So that's what I use. I have used cocoa core in the past, but um, the place that I used to get it from went out of business. Um, and I really liked it. It's more expensive, though. I start with a mix. It's just a 50-50 mix of peat moss and vermiculite. Vermiculite, um, you can buy it at garden centers. Peat moss, you can buy it at Lowe's, um, garden centers, various places. I put in there fine peat moss. When you get that big cube of peat moss at the store, there are often twigs and little bits in there. I actually strain it. I got some hardware cloth, some quarter inch hardware cloth, and I made a frame. And I, and I strain the peat moss so that it's finer. I get the twigs and all that other thick stuff out. If you have a little teeny tiny tomato seed and it's struggling to come up, if you have a twig sitting on it, it's going to use all of its energy trying to push that twig away. So you want something fine and light. And the vermiculite is very light. So that's what I use. I have used cocoa core in the past, but um, the place that I used to get it from went out of business. Um, and I really liked it. It's more expensive, though. Yeah. Vermiculite, um, I prefer the vermiculite because the perlite, it has bigger chunks, and um, it's just not as fine for seed starting. The vermiculite, I 
I grow lots of things from, from seed. So I buy big, huge bags, and I find them at Stone and Soil Depot. I've seen the bags of vermiculite in most of the big box stores I've, I, in the garden area. Um, I've seen it at <coughs> Rainbow Gardens. And you can also use your, you can go buy seed starting mix. I just do this because it's cheaper. But if you're not, I'm, I'm growing lots of plants, so I'm doing it in bulk. If you're just growing a few plants, then just go buy some seed starter mix. And, and just look at it, look and make sure it's fine. You don't want, sometimes they'll say seed starter mix, but if it has big chunks of like pine bark, mulch, and any big chunks, you just don't want big <coughs> chunks. So make sure that you're getting something that really is actually fine, because you don't want, you don't want pine bark mulch sitting on top of your little tiny seed either. So. Well, once you get your planting medium, whatever you decide on, um, mix it and dampen it. Especially if you're using peat moss. Peat moss doesn't really like to absorb water unless you work the water into it first. And I don't know if you've ever noticed if you if you put potting mix in a you're, you're planting a plant, you put your potting mix in your pot, and then you put your plant in there and then you water it. And what happens? Yeah, it either goes right through it or it floats to the top and floats off the thing and part of your potting mix floats out of your pot. So you have to actually kind of work the mix, work the water into the mix before you start doing things. What I do with my, my planting medium that I'm avoiding saying soil about, I bake it. First, I mix the vermiculite and the peat moss together, and I dampen them. I get them damp. And then I put it in these trays. Um, several years ago, I was helping with the enchilada dinner at my son's school, and they had these trays left over. So yes, I'm the person at the church social when they have all the barbecue and they have all those trays. I'm like, can I have those trays before you throw them away? And then I take them home, and I bake my soil. And I have found that for me, doing this in my oven for about an hour at 350 gets the temperature up. Notice the 160 degrees. Most bacteria will be killed, apparently. And I was reading recently, you have to go up to about 180, apparently, to get the viruses. But you can just get a little thermometer and, and test it. When you're doing this, you have to make sure that your thermometer um, goes low enough. Um, I, at first, I had a candy thermometer, and it started at 200 or something. So I bake it. Yes, I do. And my husband's like, what's that smell? <laughs> <laughs> dinner. Yeah, we're not having that for dinner. Um, then you prepare your containers. You, I wash and sanitize them. And uh, you can sanitize them with hydrogen peroxide or bleach or, you know, whatever you use to sanitize your kitchen counters or whatever. Um, this is a tray that I use, and, and I put containers. You don't have to have fancy containers. You can get by with pretty much anything. The tray in the previous slide, I've used those before, and I've started plants in those. Um, these are my favorites. It's called a Speedling tray, and I have to say when I first got it in the mail, it was a mail order item. It's styrofoam, and I thought, styrofoam? I got ripped off, but I've had it for years now. <laughs> um, and the most damage I've had to these is when I've left them outside and the wind blew them and they got stuck on the neighbor's fence and that kind of thing, when I just have neglected them and abused them. Um, but they've been really good. You can also buy these little things, the Jiffy, you know, you see these a lot, the seed starter things, but you don't have to have anything fancy. Um, you can save old containers from when you previously bought plants. If you buy the little six packs that come in the peat, you know, underneath the peat thing, they have that little container. You can grow some in there. And you just space them like you would, you know, your plants as if they were dividers. You don't even have to have dividers because you're going to pot them up later. You just want to get them started. HEB cake pans that are covered, they're wonderful. I save those kind of things too. The, any, any container will work. It just has to be probably a couple of inches deep, you know, so you have some soil. People use egg cartons. I would use the egg cartons for things that are smaller. 
I probably wouldn't start peppers and tomatoes where you're going to have the deeper roots in the egg cartons. But any container, it doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to hold some soil. If it doesn't have drainage holes, you poke some drainage holes. You do want good drainage. That's the main thing. And I've grown in my, my pans. I've poked holes in the bottom of that. And then I'll have another pan that doesn't have holes underneath it. And I'll, I'll put the water in the pan that doesn't have the holes. I'll set the pan that has the holes inside it, and that's how I'll water it. We'll talk more about watering here in just a second. You fill the containers with your damp planting medium. Notice I said damp. Once again, it needs to be damp because once you water it, if it's not damp, it'll just roll off the top, and, and it won't do you much good. Just wash it in or just put it No, when, when I bake it or when I'm planting when it in? When you fill the container. When I fill the container, I water it well so that it soaks down in. Okay. That's the one time that I will water from above. Most of the time, once I get the seeds planted, I'll water from below because I don't want the top to be wet all the time. But when I'm first filling it up, I'll take a hose with the squirter, you know, the, the mister, where you, the nozzle where you can adjust it, and I'll kind of force the soil down into those cubes. So that, that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, now we've got our soil sterilized and it's in our containers and our soil is slightly damp. Um, now we're going to talk about seeds. <laughs> Buy seeds from a reliable source. Avoid the seed packets. This drives me crazy. <laughs> Avoid the seed packets that have been exposed to the weather. I've actually gone to places and the seed packets had gotten wet and then stuck together and they're faded from the sun, and they're just a mess. So avoid those. They, they are probably not going to germinate as well as, as the ones that are fresh. I, like, I tend to mail order my seeds a lot of the time. And I have on there save money, buy in bulk. I'll buy, and they come in mylar packets, and I'll, I'll share them with my friends. I, bought a bunch of seeds. When I first found out about bulk seed buying, I called up all my gardening friends and I said, this is what I have. And we actually measured them out with teaspoons and weighed them and, you know, they, we shared seeds, but I, I've had some seeds. It says use fresh seeds. Um, I have to admit that I don't always do that, but you can test the germination and we'll talk about that in a second. If they're stored well, seeds can last quite a long time. <coughs> Notice that one was in a Mylar bag. I, I will put my seeds in Ziploc bags and suck the air out of them um, and, and store them in the dark. I don't store them in the fridge or anything because I don't have room in my fridge. Mm -hmm. That would probably be, that might be a good idea, I just don't have room. And I've heard of people freezing their seeds and, and that kind of thing. Um, I have on occasion done things like um, started my seeds in tissue paper, which we'll show in just a second, and put them in the fridge because there's some seeds that like to have the cold, the vernalization before they start. Um, use fresh seeds, pre-treating seeds, and um, testing for germination. So that's what we're going to talk about now. The pre-treating of seeds is not absolutely necessary, but it's probably not a bad idea. Um, and I the first one is what I use. I soak it in a solution of half and half water and hydrogen peroxide. And it, it recommends for 10 minutes. I've done it for longer, I don't know about you, but I get busy in <laughs> doing things. When I'm growing a lot of different varieties, and let's say I'm only planting four you know, celebrity tomato plants, and then I'm planting four sun gold tomato plants. I found that um, muffin tins work really well for this. I have the little mini muffin tins that have like 12 holes. So I get two or three of those and then I can put the seeds in there and treat them without. Yeah, there's that big huge beaker in the picture. I wouldn't actually use a big huge beaker and fill it up this big and then have seeds like this. I tend to, um, I, I'll put a little bit of the solution in the muffin tins and I'll add the seeds. And I'll keep, before I do that, I'll make a chart of what seed is going where. Always, always, always keep record. I have had mystery plants 
was like, I have no idea what kind of tomato this is. It's a tomato plant, and it still grows tomatoes and everything. But I like to know what I'm growing um, because it's frustrating to say, oh, that one did great. I wish I could plant that again. I wish I knew what it was. Um, and I, I'll, I'll have friends that will we'll, we'll trade our produce, you know. And, and I'll say, oh, what variety was that? That was so good. Well, I don't know. The tag just said tomato. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> but those are some, some ways that you can pre-treat your seeds. I've done the heat treatment. I tried it one time, and I was just nervous the whole time. I thought, I'm going to kill my seeds and boil them to death. And, and so I, I don't really, I haven't done that. I just did that that one time, and it worked out great. But, but it just made me nervous. I was, I, and, and you can look up online how to do that. It's basically getting boiling hot water and putting the seeds in there for a certain amount of time and then taking them out and rinsing them. And um, the other is just easier for me. I, I don't, I get distracted, you know, the doorbell will ring, the phone will ring or something, and there my seeds just boiled for a half hour, you know. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. The purpose of pre-treating is to kill pathogens, to kill fungi, to kill whatever. There are some seeds that you can buy pre-seeded, pre-treated, and uh, the main thing that comes into my mind is corn seed. How many of you have planted pink corn seed before? Yeah. The corn comes, it's, it's got, I think it's called ther theremin or something like that. But if you, if you have seeds, usually it's pink or green, and they've preceded them with a, a fungal agent. So it's to, it's to ki have clean seeds that you're planting. Because you just treated your soil and you just cleaned your soil, and you cleaned your containers, and then you put a seed, especially if you've saved it from a previous year or something, it might have pathogens on it. I think most reputable seed companies are trying to keep their seeds <coughs> clean, and, and you're probably going to be okay. Um, testing for germination. Once again, this isn't absolutely necessary, um, but I, I tend to have some old seeds that I'm still willing to try to see, or maybe a friend will give me seeds and say, try this, and I'll look at the packet, and it says expired 10 years ago, you know? <laughs> and, and sometimes I'll go ahead and try it anyway. One of the ways that you can test for germination is just to get a paper towel, put it on a plate, get it damp, put your seeds on there, and you can either cover them up, or if they're very small, you may not even need to cover them up. In that example, they didn't even cover them up. This one, they pulled it back, and you can see the little seed sprouted and has its little roots and everything. Um, but I, I have done this on occasion. There are times also when I've, if I'm using old seed, which, like you said, not really recommended, um, but if I happen to have old seed and I want to try it, I'll get a little container, like um, the little things that the six packs come in, the peat moss six packs, those little plastic containers, or um, a strawberry container works really well because it already has drainage holes. You know, the, the plastic things you buy strawberries in. And I'll put some of my um, potting mix, and I'll put the seeds in there, and I'll just put a whole bunch of seeds. Just scatter, plant them in there, and there will be, gob you know, a lot of them. And either a lot of them will come up, usually I'm probably surprised, or none will come up. And I'll know, okay, that's a bad seed packet. I won't even bother. It goes in the compost. So, um, so it, it's nice to test your germination, especially if you're doubtful. If you don't think your seeds are going to be really good seeds, don't go to the trouble of putting them in something like this. Okay? Pre-test them because otherwise it's really disappointing, especially if you have different things. Let's say I'm doing two rows of tomato, two rows of pepper, and, and I'm changing, and everything came up but these two rows here. Well, I'm still watering them and taking care of them, and then I have two blank rows. So, so that's when it's nice to go ahead and pre-test. My seeds just boiled for a half hour, you know? What's the purpose of pre Oh, that's a good question. The purpose of pre-treating is to kill pathogens, to kill fungi, to kill whatever. There are some seeds that you can buy pre-seeded, pre-treated, and I, the main thing that comes into my mind is corn seed. How many of you have planted pink corn seed before? Yeah. The corn comes, it's, it's got, I think it's called ther theremin or something like that. 
but if you if you have seeds, usually it's pink or green, and they've preceded them with a, a fungal agent. So it's to it's to have clean seeds that you're planting because you just treated your soil and you just cleaned your soil, and you cleaned your containers, and then you put a seed, especially if you've saved it from a previous year or something, it might have pathogens on it. I think most reputable seed companies are trying to keep their seeds clean, <coughs> and, and you're probably going to be okay. Um, testing for germination. Once again, this isn't absolutely necessary, um, but I, I tend to have some old seeds that I'm still willing to try to see, or maybe a friend will give me seeds and say, try this, and I'll look at the packet, and it says, expired 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> and, and sometimes I'll go ahead and try it anyway. One of the ways that you can test for germination is just to get a paper towel, put it on a plate, get it damp, put your seeds on there, and you can either cover them up, or if they're very small, you may not even need to cover them up. This one, they pulled it back, and you can see the little seed sprouted and it has its little roots and everything. Um, but I, I have done this on occasion. There are times also when I, if I'm using old seed, which is not really recommended, um, but if I happen to have old seed and I want to try it, I'll get a little container, like um, the little things that the six packs come in, the peat moss six packs, those little plastic containers, or um, a strawberry container works really well because it already has drainage holes. You know, the, the plastic things you buy strawberries in. And I'll put some of my um, potting mix, and I'll put the seeds in there, and I'll just put a whole bunch of seeds. Just scatter, plant them in there, and there will be, um, you know, a lot of them. And either a lot of them will come up, usually I'm pleasantly surprised, or none will come up. I'll know, okay, that's a bad seed packet, I won't even bother, it goes in the compost. So, um, so it, it's <coughs> nice to test your germination, especially if you're doubtful, if you don't think your seeds are going to be really good seeds, don't go to the trouble of putting them in something like this. Okay? Pre-test them because otherwise it's really disappointing, especially if you have different things. Let's say I'm doing two rows of tomato, two rows of pepper, and, and I'm changing, and everything came up but these two rows here. I'm still watering them and taking care of them, and then I have two blank rows. So, so that's when it's nice to go ahead and pre-test. This was an experiment that I did. I was testing for germination. These were seeds that I had saved from melons, and I had a whole bunch of them. And I didn't want to have paper plates, I mean, plates with paper towels all over my house. So I got the paper towels, and I put a strip I dampened it, and I put the seeds, and then I rolled them up. And then they only took up, instead of taking up a whole place worth, each one of those cups is a whole place worth. And I got it in my little Tupperware cake, you know, cover thing. And it actually worked out really well. They, they sprouted, and I have, those were watermelons and cantaloupes. And I, I ate quite a few watermelons and cantaloupes last year. So do you then plant those ones that sprout, or you just use yeah, the seed? Oh. I planted the ones that sprouted in this case. Yeah, and and it looked similar. This this one right here looks like a tomato seed or a pepper seed, um, but with the with the watermelon and the cantaloupe, they're bigger seeds, and so when they sprouted, they were a little bit easier to grab onto and plant. And I just stuck the root part down into the ground. I transplanted them into cups first. And I, I didn't go directly into the garden with these. Okay. <laughs> Keep a record of what you plant, <laughs> um, and, and be specific. Don't just say tomato, because if it was a tomato that you especially enjoyed, then you may not ever grow it again because you don't know what it was. And, and you can look from that little picture there, there's so many to choose from. That's what makes it fun, there's so many to choose from. Um, but, but keep records, keep records. When I, when I do these trays, <coughs> I, I made a chart on my computer, and I just printed it out. And I don't know if you notice, on the end, I made a design. Mm -hmm. And so on my chart, I just put that on, on one side of the page. 
And then I know what everything is in relationship to it. I'm going to plant some seeds tonight. I already made my charts, and I picked out the seed packets that I wanted to use. And the seed packets are bundled in order, <laughs> and the charts are filled out with, with which seeds I'm going to be growing. And I have, I'm going to be growing four of each type. That's a tray of 72. <laughs> So I'm going to have, I don't know, what is it? 300 plus. Yeah. I'll have, I'll, well, each, I'm going to grow four cubicles. Oh, okay. And so if I hadn't labeled that, they're all, toma they're all tomatoes and peppers. I'm going to plant three <coughs> flats of tomatoes and peppers tonight. And if I didn't have a chart, there's no way I'd remember what went into which hole. <laughs> I, you know, I can plant one tray and then one other tray of just two different things and can't remember which is which. Okay, planting the actual seeds. Um, to me, th this is when it gets really, really fun, the choosing what you're going to grow and starting to plant the seeds. Um, don't plant too deeply. That's the, the first big mistake that people make. You don't want the seed using all of its stored energy to break up through two inches of soil. And um, so, so don't plant too deeply. The, the rule of thumb that I've heard is plant half, half the size of the seed. So some of this, that's, that's very shallow. What I do frequently is I will, I, I used to sit down and I used to poke each seed down into the soil you know, and try to get it to be the right depth. <laughs> and that took a lot of time, poking the seed into the soil and trying not to poke it too deep. So what I do now is I'll, um, especially on smaller seeds, bean seeds and things that are bigger, I just plant those out in the garden generally. And they go deeper. But your tomato seeds, your pepper seeds, your eggplants, those, those littler seeds, um, I will just put them on the surface. And then I'll go back later and either um, put some vermiculite on top of them, or I'll get, I have a screen that I bought in Clarence Lane Walmart, and I, I will screen my potting mix so that it's very fine, and just screen it over the top of the things, off of the seeds. So the seeds are just laid on. Um, another advantage, what I used to do too, is I would put the seed and I'd poke it down, I'd put the seed and I'd poke it down, and then I'd go, which, which thing, which hole is next? How many have I planted? So I lay all the seeds down first. <laughs> and then I know, oh yeah, I put a seed in that cubicle already. Otherwise I lose track. So you mm -hmm. just plant one in a cubicle? She asked, do I just plant one in a cubicle? If I'm pretty, if it's good, fresh seed, then I'm more likely to plant one in a cubicle. <clears throat> if it's getting a little oldish, I'll plant two, three, four, and, and hope that one of them comes up. Like that's that's not the best practice. It's best, like I said, just use fresh seed, you're you're a little more sure of success. But if you if you're going to plant those are if you're gonna plant something that you saved or a friend gave you and you don't know its history, then I would suggest maybe trying one more than one in each cube. Good question, thank you. Does seed orientation matter? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes, it can matter. Now, do farmers, when they're planting their fields, go out and make no. sure that each seed is oriented a certain way? No, they don't. So your seeds will grow, but they'll have an easier time if they're not having to, to send their root up there and then back down into the ground and get all twisted. Um, as a general rule, the pointy part, like if you're doing cucumbers and um, squash seeds, melon seeds that have the pointy part, pointy part down. If in doubt, just put it sideways. <laughs> just, you know, if you're like, I'm not sure which, which way it should go, put it sideways so at least it only has to go 50%. Does that make sense? <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you're not sure and you put it all the way backwards, then you know it's going to have to struggle. But when in doubt, just lay it flat. That's what Mother Nature is going to do when the wind blows the seeds and they come along. They're just going to get blown flat onto the ground. And, and they, Mother Nature does a pretty good job of growing things. So when in doubt, um, but that's an interesting thing to look at. And you can find research that they've done 
and pictures about how they oriented different variety of seeds. We're not going to go into it too much because we're not we can't cover all you know all of the different seeds in, in this time. But but look into that if you're if you're wondering. There you'll find pictures on the internet. You'll find university research papers on which way which direction to plant the seed. Um, cover lightly with fine soil over with the light. We already talked about that. Keep them warm. And your south-facing sunny window is probably not going to cut it. <laughs> I, I got these. I left out. I got these at the Habitat for Humanity store, the restore, and they were on sale. Um, this has really sped up my germination, having them warm. People talk about putting them on your fridge, putting them, just find some place that's warm. Um, I, one year, we were renovating our bathroom, and I actually just put plant shelves in the bathroom and, and kept them in there and put a heater in there so it was isolated. When they are first planted, they don't really need light, they need warmth. They need warmth and some moisture, not to be drowned, but just some moisture. Once they start popping up is when they need the light. But they need to be warm. There are charts online. If you type in something like optimal germination temperatures for vegetables, there are charts online that will tell you. And, and they'll show this percentage grew are, are sprouted at this temperature, this percentage sprouted. And, and they've, there's been a lot of research into the temperature that seedlings need to get started. And you'll find charts online. Um, label them when you plant them. Label them. I have said with my tray there, I have a chart. And I started you now because I started losing the charts. <laughs> so now I take a picture of the chart after I make the chart. And then I have the chart for when I go in the yard. And I put the chart in the sleeves, the plastic sleeves, so that when I'm using it outside, it doesn't get damp in the ink and that kind of thing. And when I'm planting them, I'll, if I'm planting them directly into the garden, then I can take that outside. Did I mention that you should label them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, you've planted your seeds, you sterilized your soil, you've got clean containers, um, and they just poked their heads up. Get them under light immediately. Here, a lot of the times we can take them outside. I'll, I'll start my plants inside, and if the weather's pleasant, I'll take them outside for a little bit to get some sunlight. The sunlight is best, but when they're really brand new, if it gets too hot or too cold, they're going to be damaged. You still want to regulate that temperature. So if you're having a, a beautiful day and it's 75 degrees outside, and you stick them in the sun and there's not much wind and it's calm, wonderful. Um, but chances are it's going to get cold again this time of year at night, and there will be winds and that kind of thing. So you want light. And this is, these are my lights at home. I don't have special grow lights. I don't have a special shelf. I'm too cheap for that. Um, I just went and bought a metal shelf from one of the big box stores somewhere. And the lights, these are just regular old shop lights. They're, they're nothing fancy. They're just regular old shop lights. And I put on there 12 plus hours a day. I really should have put 16. I, if they're only under the lights and the weather's too cold to get them outside in the sun, they're under the lights for 16 hours. Can you use a regular old heating pan to start those seeds? She asked if you could use a regular old heating pan to start your seeds. Maybe um, they get a little bit warmer than the heat mats do. So you may need to test it. One thing that I've done is on my trays, I'm going to go back to the tray where I have it filled up. I'll put a thermometer uh, on in the corner or whatever and, and see what is my soil temperature. You can buy little cheapo thermometers that will do that like at the dollar store, I think, or, or H-E-B or whatever. They're not very expensive. And I'll, it's the kind with the little prong and I'll just poke it into the corner of my soil and see what, what is my soil. How, how cold or warm is it? And then I'll adjust accordingly. Um, the heat mats, they are kind of pricey. I got them cheap. I probably wouldn't have gotten them if they hadn't been so cheap. But I'm so glad I have them now. 
and now I probably would go study full price for them. Um, but yeah, just they need to be warm. And if you look up the charts, most of the vegetables, I would say between 70, 80, 85, for most of them, is a good temperature for germination. Um, and some are a little bit warmer, and some are a little bit cooler, but around that 70 to 80, you'll probably be pretty safe for most, most of your vegetables. So there are the just plain old lights. Um, let there be light and more light. And that really should, if you're using grow, if you're, I say grow lights, if artificial lighting rather than sun, then 16 hours a day. I know that it says 12, but it probably should say 16. The 12 is if you're, if you're getting some sunlight, if you're kind of using a mix of the two. But they need lots and lots of light. And keep the lights close to them. I keep the lights about an inch, no more usually than two inches from the plants. You don't want them so close that they'll burn them. As they get older, they don't need quite as much light because they have more leaves absorbing light. So you can, you can back it off a little bit. One to two inches. Yeah, I keep it, I keep it close. And this has been the main thing that I've noticed with helping me grow healthy seedlings. When I didn't have the lights, when I wasn't using lights and I was putting them in the window or trying to take them outside when the weather was pleasant, I ended up with real long, scrawny, leggy plants. Um, has anybody else ever run into that? <laughs> yeah, and when I started doing the lights, I started having shorter plants that had thicker stems. And they're they're nice and healthy. Would the lights keep the those cubicles warm? She asked, Will the lights keep the cubicles warm? They will contribute to the warmth. Yes, they will. Another thing that I've done on my growth shelves, I bought those um, emergency blankets. They're only a couple of dollars at Walmart, but they're reflective. Like and I minor? like the mylar blankets, mm -hmm. the silver mylar blankets, mm -hmm. and I wrapped my shelves in that because my shelves are on the patio. Um, I wrapped the shelves in that. It protected from the wind, but it also reflected the light back in there, and it kept things warmer. Because the lights do produce some warmth. They're not as warm as the heating mat, um, but they do provide some warmth. I've used space heater before, and, and just put it when I had it in my bathroom when we were remodeling. Um, I put the space heater in there and just kept that warm. It didn't want the whole house that temperature, but. Um, now your seedlings have grown, you've given some light. This picture is not the best picture. <laughs> it shows proper watering techniques, but plants don't look tremendously healthy, so <laughs> there maybe was a problem with the soil there. But the watering, you want to water from below. You don't want the surface of the soil to constantly be damp. If the surface of the soil is constantly damp, then you're going to have mold on there, fungi, you're going to have pathogens that are going to grow there, and then you're going to have the damping off. So even though you sterilize it, you still might have problems with the damping off. I occasionally, I don't do it every single time that I water, but um, I sometimes mix hydrogen peroxide in there and, and do that, give them another little cleansing occasionally. Do you use distilled water or tap water? Or I just use tap water. I've, I've read on sites that that where they recommend the distilled water. Or if you had a rain but, barrel, you could use your rain water. I probably wouldn't use my rain water for that. Just because there are lots, I have lots of cats in my neighborhood and squirrels and possums and all sorts of critters that will be walking on my roof and birds oh, leaving okay. their droppings. So it's not going to be very clean water. I would use clean water. But I definitely love my rain water for my garden when it's outside. How do you do that? little extra cleaning. You just put hydrogen peroxide in the water. Mm -hmm. How much? I, I don't use a whole lot. I don't use it the one to one ratio no. for that. I just use like um, a like a tablespoon in a gallon or a table actually more like a tablespoon in a quart I would say. In a quart. In a quart. Just a little bit to, um, also once they start growing leaves the true leaves when they first start sprouting, you have a couple of funny leaves that grow. And they're not what the plant is going to end up looking like. They're just kind of funny looking leaves. These are, they're called cotyledons, 
or sometimes people call them seed leaves. This is a tomato plant. And you have the first leaves that come are just like long skinny leaves. And then the first two leaves are the <coughs> ones that have the texture, the convolutions. Mm -hmm. um, so once they get to that point, I start what I've heard the term fertigating. So when I water, I use a very diluted solution, a fertilizer and water. So the if you, I like to use liquid fertilizer for this because it's easier. You could get regular fertilizer and dissolve it and kind of try to figure out what ratio you need and everything. Liquid fertilizer is easier for this stuff. But diluted. But like diluted. So if, if let's say that your liquid fertilizer instructions say use one tablespoon per gallon of water, then you use a fourth of a tablespoon per gallon of water. Um, just dilute it. If it's very dry, if you're doing your seedlings in the summertime, trying to get them started for your fall garden, your plants are going to dry out faster, then I wouldn't fertigate every time. If you're having to water frequently because things are drying out, then, then water and then fertigate, water and fertigate. For the ones that are growing in the winter, they don't dry out as quickly. You don't need to water them as often. And so I, I would maybe do it every time. But if you're having to water a lot, then back off on that solution. Do less so you don't get too much fertilizer. This watering, do you still do that under the Yes, I still do. And what I do with this, I do it underneath, and then once the plants have absorbed what they can handle, um, then I pour the excess out on something else that's a bigger plant or something that I want to grow. I don't just toss it down the drain. I, I take it out and I, I generally water something. And then that, whatever I water with that gets a little bit of fertilizer too. Um, potting up. That example on the right, they got a little bit big. <laughs> I probably should have potted those up a little bit sooner. Those are peppers and tomatoes. Um, but once they get big and they're starting to outgrow their pots, they need to go into bigger pots. When you're potting up, you can use a coarser potting mix. I don't always sterilize this. If I'm growing things and they're going to have to stay in the house for a little while longer, then I'll use my sterile mix. If, it's, if, if the weather's getting nicer, they're going to go outside, um, then I'll use, I, won't, I won't necessarily sterilize that mix. And I'll add some things. I have a worm bin, so I'll add some of my worm compost. <clears throat> Maybe you could add some slow-release fertilizer, you know, for house plants, that kind of thing. Um, I, this is what I have peat moss, because I want really good drainage for these. And the peat moss helps with the drainage. And it makes it lighter, too, for the pots. Oh, you go back? Slow release. Slow release fertilizer. <coughs> and have something like Osmocote, something, you know, little pellets that slowly dissolve over time. Or you could keep just fertilizing it like with the water solution too. Um, use containers that are just slightly larger. There's no point putting a little tomato plant into a huge pot because then you're using more potting mix you're going to have to use more water. You're just using more resources. So just go just the next level up. It doesn't need to go huge yet. Um, hold the seedlings. See how she's holding that? She's got that little seed leaf that she's holding. Don't, don't strangle the thing. Don't grab it by the neck and yank it out of the pot and <laughs> stick it in. Um, another really good idea I heard, if you have, when you're using the trays, you can't do this. But let's say that she's got something um, that she has, let's say that she's putting this from this pot into a bigger one. If you're growing from a little pot into a slightly bigger pot, leave the plant in the pot, put that pot inside the other pot, fill up with soil around that pot, take the little pot out, take the plant out and your hole's the right size. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. So I have a small container, and I'm going to be planting into a bigger container. So I have my small container. I set it in the bigger container with the plant still in the, con in the small container. I fill around that small container with the soil. I take the small container out. I take the plant out of it, and the roots will fit into that hole I just made. Then it'll be planted. You have the right amount without a whole lot of mess. Like a mold, yeah, like a mold. The good kind of mold. <laughs> Not the plant killing kind. Um, 
So you've got them into your slightly bigger containers, and now it's time to start hardening them off. And all that hardening off means is that they're getting used to the outdoors and, and the conditions that they're going to be growing in. So a couple of weeks before planting, just start putting them outside. Let them get used to the, the harsher sun, the cooler weather. Um, you'll still need to probably bring them in. Watch out for freezes, that kind of thing. Watch out for strong winds. You don't want it out there in super strong winds, but it's kind of nice for them to start getting gentle breezes. They'll start getting stronger. Their stems will stiffen up, and, and they'll be more ready to live outside on a regular basis. Um, when I start my plants, I, I kind of start hardening them off from the very beginning. But if you were living in a place that was much colder than here, and you didn't have a chance to ever get that outside, this is especially important. Um, like I said, for me, I start from the very beginning. Once they start growing, I try to get them a little bit of real sunlight on pleasant days that I can. And that's just another little article. If you just type in um, seed starting TAMU on the search, you'll get this link. Whenever I, whenever I, my first thing, whenever I do a search on Google, and I'm trying to find out something plant oriented, I type my question in and then I put TAMU after it. Because they're, they're the ones that are doing the research in our area and, and have good advice for growing things in Texas and the and that's my presentation. So. If you have any questions about gardening in general or this video specifically, please contact our Bear County Master Gardener helpline. If you'd like more information about becoming a Bear County Master Gardener, then please check out our website. If you'd like to know more about the Texas Master Gardener Association, then please check out our state's website.